Oh, thank you very much. Um, for this presentation, it's taken out from a publication that we released in 2018. It's the toolkit, or in short, I call it GDK, uh, meeting the challenges of finding a buried and blind deposit in Northwest Queensland. Um, I'll just acknowledge the uh, author. You know, uh, it's Keith Hannon from Jokem Pacific in New Zealand, uh, Richard Lilly from University of Adelaide, and myself from GSQ. Well, what's the inspiration behind this? You know, it's a product that, you know, we have um, sort of put out. I've got to tell you, um, I got this inspiration from this guide, you know, expression guide given to me by a colleague from the New South Wales Geological Survey. And um, Um, it's an exploration guide. And, you know, when I saw this, you know, I think I, I told myself, I must do one for Queensland as well. And so when the uh, SREP has been announced before the, um, I think the ink dries up, you know, um, within the first week, I'm on the phone, you know, with Keith and, you know, um, Richard Lilly trying to sort of start, you know, brainstorm to put out a um, product like this. And so um, within a month, I think we all got together and started brainstorming and we tried to in, induct, you know, um, Rick uh, Valenta into it, but he's too busy. And so it ended up with the three of us in. Um, well, this product is uh, like an A5, you know, with a hundred page uh, thing. And we think that, you know, we coming from Queensland, we have to do it better and bigger. Well, Queensland is well known for things that's big. Got to admit, you know, we got a big pineapple. What else have we got? Well, the next we have is um. Oops. Yeah, we got a big mango as well. And it's not just that we got a big bull as well, enough to put the steak on your place for the next one whole year. And it's not just a good thing that we have. We had a big can toad as well as big green frogs, you know, um, on the big, you know, sort of um, gumboots. And so we decided, well, let's do it. We do something big, a big guidebook for Queensland as well. Well, where's the inspiration? What's the driver behind this? I think this goes back a fair while, you know, backwards. At the uh, sort of conclusion meeting and with the uh, PMDCRC, that's in Townsville, uh, sorry, in Mount Isa then, an explorer came up to me, and obviously he doesn't know I come from geological survey. He told me that, you know, these days geological survey and all the researchers always go back to all mines, to all drill coals, and you know, all material, and do all this research, and then come back and tell us, look, you know that big hole we found out, you know, from our research, it's a copper gold mine, and you know, um, I, it really sort of you know haunts me until today that we have to do something different. We got to do instead of that, we have to start from a green field, a sort of plant boring field, and find something and find that big hole that's underneath. It's not something impossible because most of these area, uh, sort of big holes occurs under very or uh, relatively shallow cover between 30 to about 100 meters, where your chemistry can still work if it's unconsolidated. Basically, the whole idea of the toolkit is trying to sort of forward model forward model it, you know, um, where we could start with a barren flat land to a big hole in the ground. Well, before we start this talk, let us look at what's the facts behind um, this, this uh, expression in uh, Manaza. Manaza has been a very mature expression, you know, destination with over 70 years of best metal exploration. And there are over 3,500 tenures that has covered this area. In other words, it's well explored. And from the conclusion, from the brainstorming that we came together, we realized that, you know, um, vast area of this Manaza is still underexplored, either for blind deposits or for concealed deposits, or we had a wrong model. And so it's really important to think laterally. And we also acknowledge that explorers generally had a very good idea about the geology and the mineralization. Basically, they knew lots about the, you know, sort of horse rock, the mineralization style, etc. except a lot of these are not exposed. It's undercover, either concealed or too deep. And therefore, a lot of the issue in 
exploring in Northwest is not because they lack knowledge, but it's actually a targeting thing. And that's where the geochemical toolkit tries to come in and resolve some of these. Well, what's the philosophy behind this? Well, the toolkit, it's designed as a multi-approach blueprint for exploring, you know, uh, under, either deep or undercover during the pre-discovery period. Okay, I stress with pre-discovery and I explain what it is. Well, it's nothing, you know, we didn't create anything new, but actually we review all the geological techniques that's used, all the data that's been collected, and then, you know, we evaluate those, look at the examples, and then recommend techniques that's applicable, that has ended up with successes in the Northwest Peninsula. When you talk about mineral expression stages, um, this is generally the stages we uh, sort of did not include the um, project generation part, which comes before that. But in the pre-discovery, generally you had the stages of review, review past work, past data, past models, etc. The reconnaissance, I prefer orientation study. And with the learning from the orientation study, you could sort of use it in targeting and testing, and then telescope down to a sort of in a zones where you could actually find an ore deposit. What the toolkit covers is this pre-discovery stage, and we try to do the review and the recognitions for you. And so you could use it and apply it into targeting and telescoping. Well, what is it set out for? It's set out as an overview for the different techniques used, both in outcropping and undercover. Secondly, it helps detecting you to detect what's you know um, the actual signal, whether it's signal or digital signal, uh, in all different types of you know expression media, and it provides guidelines to the uh, actual processing by actually pulling in real examples uh, of successes in the area. And although this is not you know mentioned clearly, we really like to promote you know high resolution you know pathfinder chemistry for greenfield exploration. That's one of the main names under those you know, boring cover to find that big hole in the ground. Next question is how do we use the geochemical toolkit? As I mentioned, it has been released, it's out there. Well, the key message is, is to have success, you need the right techniques for the right ground. And the toolkits divide the exploration setting, especially undercover into four domains. These domains are classified based on the type of cover and the thickness of cover. The domain one, which I just simplified as D1, is for outcropping in a sort of geology that includes about a meter uh, of cover. And domain two to four are under covers. The domain two is for unconsolidated cover, you know, with depth of one to, 20, uh, one to 25. And domain three from 25 to about 100, if it's still unconsolidated, it probably goes deeper. And domain four, it's for ones that's in a consolidated cover itself. And therefore the techniques, we have recommended techniques for those different domains. And I will talk about this in the talk tomorrow uh, in the domain um, uh, talk itself. But the techniques can be variable because, you know, for example, you know, if you get a blind deposit, it's probably under the same category of domain four in the consolidated ones. And therefore you need things like soil gas or hydrogeochemistry itself. This is the geochemical setting, and it's same between you know um, exposed and undercover. Basically, the four settings are once it's all that's exposed to the surface, where the chemistry can be taken, deciphered, you know, right at the surface. The other one is systems that's exposed, but it has been degenerated through alterations into a daughter product like gossams, clays, salts, uh, laterite, silk, silkrit, etc. And the chemistry reflects the original in you know, a deposit, but it's been modified. Third is the undercover ones, which has signals that goes through the surface, through conduits. And this could be fault fractures, you know, water flows, etc. And the fourth is a blind deposit. Under the cover, it has the same thing. But if the cover is thin, the chemistry would get through, but at a much diluted sort of, you know, concentration. If it's deep, generally it doesn't get through the surface. And then you need other techniques like plants where the roots tap into this chemistry and then you can sample the plants or groundwater. And I mentioned this groundwater because I'm giving a talk on groundwater and I'm excited about the talk because we found something exciting. Or soil gas. So I'm promoting it now, don't miss it. <laughs> um, for the two kids, there are eight chapters. The first four chapters is dedicated to this bedrock or the uh, bedrock domain. 
and the latter part is for the undercover domains. And because each domain is like a paper on its own, I don't have the time to go through. And I hope you will sort of download the, um, the actual publications and go to them. Uh, because I will go through briefly. The first chapter is about conventional geochemistry. Second, about differentiating Gaussians and uh, ironstone. Third is about the use of lead isotopes and we use it for the hydrogeochemistry. And fourth is about stable isotopes. What's included in the first um, chapter for the conventional geochemistry is, is we reviewed the Queensland expression data for you know, Queensland. And there are over 1 million geochemistry for that Northwest Queensland area. And basically we go through the soil, the rock chips, the stream sediments, and appraise the data, how many percentage of it is suitable for um, um, recognition or for detailed study, et cetera, by looking at the um, detection limit. What we have done is, is sorry, um, we've looked at the, um, the actual chemistry, the detection limits and plot, you know, background levels against it. And then using that, we can have a guide, you know, how much data is suitable for, you know, background study. For example, for recognizance, about 25, that's where the continental background would tell you, you know, there is something there or there isn't. Whereas for more detailed study, you need, you know, uh, things that's much higher, like a 5 ppm, you know, sort of background level itself. Chapter two is about differentiating, you know, Gaussians and ironstone. Uh, and ironstone. This is a work done by MIM Exploration, you know, in the early 2000s, and it's headed by Keith Hannon. And so we included his work into this publication. He generated two uh, filters. One is the regional filters, and the other is the Mount Isa filters. The number 10 means that that's a factor that differentiates between ironstone and the, um, the uh, Gaussian itself. But it, the, the example below this shows that, you know, this is an ISA filter where you plot your chemistry into that. And you could see that, you know, it differentiates the um, ironstone from the Gaussians very well. Chapter three is about lead isotopes. And this is work from Graham Carr. And we basically look at the two systems. One, the lead rich system, like, you know, Kennington, um, um, Google River, et cetera. And the other one is the IOCG, which has a low lead level and it has a long tail, you know, lead evolution tail itself. Uh, I will discuss this in the hydrogeochemistry in a sort of um, talk tomorrow, but with, using this, you can, you know, plot your isotopic data into this kind of template and find out whether you have an IOCG or you have a sort of, you know, um, lead rich isotopes and whether it falls into this sort of trend to make, uh, to give you a guide whether it's prospective or not. And the first chapter is about, you know, um, using stable isotopes, you know, um, oxygen, carbon, and sulfur itself. And we show an example of mine as a mine. Um, it's from Hannon, sorry, it's not from you, Rick. <laughs> um, looking at, you know, um, calcites, you know, in the, the actual vein itself, and calcite, you know, like this, this figure, differentiated calcites, you know, from uh, host rock and the vein itself. And the second one is just in you know, a repository of you know uh, sulfur. Um, I won't go into that, but you know it's all written up in the chapter itself. For the second part, it's undercover geochemistry. It's uh, the first chapter. Chapter five is for the uh, domain three, uh, domain two for the sort of shallow ones. We talk about the different techniques that work. Uh, chapter six is about this uh, you know the uh, deeper ones, and we pull examples, five actual examples of successes, you know, using the um, or exploration in that area and seven for the deeper ones. And then we talk about hydrogeochemistry. In the domain two, we discuss selective leaching, soil gas, biogeochemistry, and importantly, geochemistry exploration, how to use geochemistry within the cover and at the base of, you know, the uh, cover at the top of this uh, basement, the protozoic basement. In chapter six, we uh, discuss five examples. The, um, Ernest Henry and um, E1 or um, Mar Margaret, the L. Lewis, Kennington and Osborne. And it's, it's all documented in there that you could have a good read about the history as well as techniques used. Uh, this is an example of the Ernest Henry where we compare enzyme reach against MMI. Um, these are just the different lines you know, from different campaign. If you look at this, the enzyme reach of the different lines, you could see, you know, the, although this is partial leaching. This is where the ozone is, you know, and you have about 50 meters of cover. We still pick up signatures past the 50 meters cover. This is for quaternary sand. Again, it's, um, it's using 
four different methods, the uh, enzyme leach, MMI, and total digestion. And you could see the total digestion has a really very muted sort of, you know, um, sort of chemistry, whereas the other partial leaching is much more sensitive. Therefore, I'm um, basically saying that, you know, partial leaching can be very successful if you use it correctly. Chapter seven, just talk about the different campaigns in the deeper areas. Um, um, and these are all the campaigns that we, we sort of touch on. And the last chapter is talking about hydrogeochemistry. And like I said, I'm going to talk about it um, on the Cloncari area, but this is done over the Ernest Henry you know, area. It's an example to show that it works. Well, to conclude, the geochemical uh, toolkit is designed to help explorer um, to investigate deeper targets and to have success. It's just to sort of expedite you know, the whole process. It's is a compilation of the state of knowledge for geochemical exploration in Northwest Queensland. And I think, you know, if we are looking at, you know, um, uh, future like uh, new economic minerals or strategic metals, chemistry is pivotal because that's the only way to tell cobalt from copper, et cetera. And finally, this is, way, um, this is a website that you can download this uh, report itself. And um, for those who miss out, uh, we've given out 200 hard copies and I think Adelaide you UD has published 58, so it's gone already, but you can still download the sort of digital copy from the website. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Do we have any questions? Yes, okay. Yep, Yon? Oh, I do. Oh, yeah. uh, thanks for the talk, very interesting. I just, I was surprised to hear that you said it's correctly one million samples where you have yes. geochemistry across geochemistry. Mount and Lai. That's right. So, well, maybe a silly question, but with one million data sets across the exposed areas, we couldn't find a deposit. How many do we need for the unexposed I areas? Think, um, I think I mentioned it um, briefly that a lot of these are very concentrated in, you know, sort of, you know, what initially they call prospective zone. So they do not look in between those zones. And so um, some areas are explored to death, but there are big gaps in, in between that has not been looked at. So do you think it would be useful to have a program to actually sample in between zones? I think the techniques has to be different because um, most of these zones are picked out on the faults or fractures that thing. And there are solid areas where you probably need salt gas or hydrogeochemistry over that area where it sort of looks much deeper into blind deposit. And I think, you know, it's not look at this because there's no signature at surface and people just write it off. Okay, so sorry, just along that. So basically we have a good data set of near deposit signal, geochemical signal, but not very good one for far signal, for far away signal. Okay, um, I think um, that's where I mentioned about high sensitivity data, because a lot of this um, exploration has used quite low sensitivity with Basically, you know, you're looking at the detection limit almost on par or higher than the background level. We need much better, you know, sort of um, data, you know, to complement those million data points in between. And I know that, you know, um, Chinova is doing some excellent work at the moment, you know, looking at stream sediments over the, you know, uh, some of these areas where they are taking multi elements. And that's how, you know, you could bridge those gaps with the data that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. That's awesome. Um, really good work. And so I've got two questions. I miss. I may have missed it, but is ultrafine in there? And then no. the the other other question is: Are you going to be continually updating this as new information and techniques emerge? Um, we haven't thought about updating. Um, we have a program on ultrafines. You know, with. Um, I won't mention the company, I think it's still, still hell. Um, but we have a program to see how effective it is. And, you know, um, I think we only include success story in this so that, you know, people could actually adopt it. And if it's a technique that really works, we could have an updated version of this as well in the future. Cool, do we have on some online as well? Great. Mark Arundel is asking, is the raw data referenced in the examples that are available to review? The raw data for this publication is in the appendices, yes. Okay, I'm just clicking across. There is a, there's a, a 
a great comment here um, from Josh Lee. Uh, Good at Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's talking about digests and um, and stuff. I'll just read out the comment, but it is quite long. Um, and I don't think it's so much of a question. He's saying one criticism of partial digests, et cetera, for delineate, delineating deer chemistry through cover is that it's often difficult to know what's anomalous or more specifically what's mineralized or what's not. In other words, a copper high can be a different lithology rather than a structure hosting charcoal pyrite mineralization, broadly speaking. Very good point. Yeah. There you go. Further alteration lithology and others is difficult to determine and therefore techniques uh, like air core drilling have been used to obtain that data. What are your thoughts on that comparison? Is this an either or situation or is there real power in using both in conjunction where air core, for example, helps ground truth data? Uh, the partial leach, it's a really powerful if it's used you know, in the correct sense. Because what it does is, is if you imagine if you get a grain, a, a, a grain you know, of, of um, sort of um, substrate, we don't want to dissolve the substrate itself, but we just want what's on top of it. And that's the whole idea of partial, you know, that we do not dilute the chemistry with the substrate, you know, from the, the layer of sediments. And in that sense, if you choose the right ones, for example, MMI is really good for, you know, um, uh, clay and, and organic rich, and, you know, um, regular rich is good for, you know, um, iron oxide and manganese rich sediments, et cetera. If you choose the right method, you could exclude dissolving the substrate and therefore you just concentrate on what's outside the grain itself. And that is a real powerful tool. And so if you use it correctly, collect it at the same sort of you know, um, interval or depth interval, it will definitely show up anomaly. Mike Whitbread has also commented, um, partial yeah, leach need more background sampling to know if those spikes are real. Yes, yes. I, I do agree with that. 